Well, welcome to every single campus to week three of Common Sense. But could we take a moment, put our hands together for every single volunteer that has served us in the house. Come on, from our worship team's production. Come on, give it up for the car park attendants, for our adventure kids, legends, hospitality, operations, and it all goes on. We love you. And whatever campus you're at, welcome to church. I'm sure you've already been welcomed. If you're online in the local, it's great to have you with us. How are you doing, Pastor Paul? Doing really well, excited for today. It's going to be a great day. And if you weren't here, for whatever reason, maybe you're away with the kids for school holidays, really want to encourage you uh, to dive into the last two Sundays where we've been unpacking this reality of creating a financial freedom pathway. And week one, Pastor Paul spoke and talked around, I guess, the concept of what this pathway looks like, the four key ingredients. He touched on those last week. I had the chance to talk on stewarding over in Australia there. Uh, Pastor Craig, Pastor Dan did a great job over there as well. But today, I thought it would be awesome if we recapped the last couple of weeks, Pastor Paul, and then I've got some commonly asked and sticky questions that I want to ask you around creating a financial freedom pathway so that we can actually practically outwork this. How many thank God that in His Word there is a way for you and I to live financially free? And we've got an incredible founding pastor who's done so much uh, over this journey of his life to help not only us understand it, but really live God's way. So how about you hit it off, Pastor Paul, with what this is all about? I love it when you call me pastor. Uh, But great to be connecting with each of the campuses. And of course, as we've already heard, anyone online I I think one of the greatest challenges to modern day Christianity and just modern day life is we want everything to happen in a moment. We'd love a miracle to happen in our finances and God is a miracle worker, but also God is absolutely committed to his word. And his word gives us the instruction of how to live. And so if you haven't been here for the last couple of weeks, just encourage you to take time, take a moment to listen to the messages as we just create this pathway Pathway needs to be walked, by the way, so you can hear it or even know the pathway, but unless you walk the pathway, you're not going to get to the destination. So let's think about that. And one of the key thoughts, and it's something that I've committed my life to live by, Marie and I, and then of course many others, is this thought that God works in principles, that uh, literally a breakthrough life is a principled life. You can have a breakthrough in a moment, but sustained breakthrough means that you'll embrace the pathway, the principles of God and walk those principles. Uh, For me personally, again, if you're here for the first time today or you've not been in life a long time, you would have heard in the past that I'm one of eight children and my parents were amazing Christians. They were people that were committed to hard work. I think that became a part of our whole journey is that we would work hard But uh, what we learned from them or what I learned from them was that generosity should be a given, that uh, we were to honour God in the first part of our increase. But I didn't understand the fullness of the pathway or the equation that brought financial freedom. So I'm going to get you, Pastor Luke, to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, because this was a foundation for my life and the shift in it. Yeah, awesome. It says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. I've said it before, but I want you to think about this. This scripture is worth stopping long enough to meditate on. This is God's promise. God said that normal Christian life should be a life of abundance. So much so that you had an overflow for every good work you saw. How many of us would find ourselves in that position yet? I think it's something that develops and matures and increases. But God's intention for you is not a survival life. It's a life where you have an abundance in quality and quantity. Go back to the original. God makes it very clear that his whole creation displayed his abundance. Everything that God does is more than enough. When he does a miracle, he provides more than enough. And so therefore, there is a commitment that we all are to make 
to live this out. And this verse that we just heard Pastor Luke read became a defining point for me because we were generous and we had honoured God with the first because that's the way we were taught, but we weren't breaking through. So therefore I said, God, how are we going to live that? And out of that came these four key thoughts, uh, discovering how we can see that breakthrough take place. The first one was, of course, stewarding. And uh, that's around the thought of tithing, but it's more about releasing God's authority in our financial worlds. That God wants to be included in the material way that we live. So as we steward what belongs to God, that breakthrough begins to happen. And literally returning back to God what belongs to Him. And there's so many questions that come with that. So you're saying that God wants to be honoured first in our finances, absolutely, because we are to steward what is not ours. God makes that so clear. Again, you can look into that. The second thought was seeding, which is activating the law of sowing and reaping. Your life currently, my life currently reflects the seed that I've sown. My attitudes, the, the impossible things being made possible is all a reflection. You reap what you sow. Uh, again, I would say that we're in a world that says uh, it's not your fault. And a lot of things are not our fault, but the good news is if you sow correctly, right. you will unlock a divine law of reaping. So even in the worst start to life, you can sow the right response And you'll get a God outcome, which is a huge part of how God operates. Pastor Luke, any thoughts on that? Well, I just, I think it's such an amazing opportunity we have where there is a divine law of sowing and reaping as Pastor Paul has mentioned and taught. And I think there was a statement you made that was quite profound in week one where you said, many things are beyond our control, but harvest is not one of them. Just think about that. Again, in all of the campuses, over in Oz, here online today, Harvest is something that you can determine Mm. by committing to sow seed in the areas you need a breakthrough in. It's a divine law. God says, you sow it, harvest will come. I'll demonstrate it by how a seed operates. Put a seed in the right kind of soil, put it in the right environment, it will produce a harvest. Even the most challenging uh, areas of our life can change. So stewarding, seeding, And then also this big thought of saving, the third part of the financial freedom equation. That's one thing my parents never taught us. That was one of the major aspects that I never understood, that saving is all about building a generational legacy. Basically, my dad's thought was this. I started with nothing. You should start with nothing. And that whole thought of you need to work. Come on, how many have a Dutch parent close to them, just punch them on the shoulder. It's kind of like, just work harder, work harder. We need to work. But this whole thought of saving to set a platform for the next generation. And all those are saying, yes, you need to hear that. No, and you'll need to do it. Because you need to keep on understanding how this financial freedom works, saving for a future breakthrough. Read Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 22 for us, Luke. Says a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. A good person leaves a legacy. There should be a legacy in every part of our lives and everything that we do. By the way, let me just say this I'll put it on the screen, but financial freedom is not an overnight miracle. Oh, I, I, I want you to pray for me after, Pastor, that I get a financial breakthrough. I'll pray for you for anything you ask me to pray for. But did you know that God works principally as much as He works miraculously? And so God wants us to live a principled approach and that thought of stewarding, seeding, and also saving. The fourth thought is to do with spending. And again, if you weren't here, I've already said it, but it's about making wise financial decisions. Huge, huge area of our lives, something we've got to keep on thinking about. Yeah, we do. And we've got some good questions around the spending because we all like to spend. 
Well, I want you to go hard on those questions. Don't just do the easy questions. <laughs> do the things that you think will make me stumble. That's good. I love the thought, though, the first week you touched on with spending, about actually taking a moment for all of us to consider this thought or this idea of delayed gratification. Yeah. Because there is bad spending and there is healthy spending. And I think for all of us, no matter what season or stage of life we're in, all four of these principles apply to where we're at right now. And they can actually have a really great consequence or alternatively a really challenging one. And I think that's why spending is as important to talk about as stewarding, seeding, and saving. In other words, only spend what you have or you're in a position to pay for. So you can, people have often said, can you borrow for a house? I said, as long as you don't become subservient to the loan, you're in a position you can get out of it at any stage. Otherwise, it begins to control you. Financial freedom is about being in a place of free, no matter where you're at. Doesn't mean you don't take big steps, but you need to go back to the God, Money and Me book to get some more information on that. It's a big call. Yeah, it's good. But let's go to the questions because I think it would be awesome to get really practical. And you, you touched on this reality of a living a life principled. A principled life makes all the difference. Why, why is it so important from your point of view when it comes to finances and living principled? Because it's not easy in the day and the age and the climate we live in, like, why would you say it is a principled living reality needed in our financial world? Let me put it like this. Rome wasn't built in a day. Same is the case with a financial breakthrough. If you've been living in poverty and out of control in finances, come back to living the principles. Principles are how God works. A principled life, remember we read it, is able to stand in the worst of the storms. So you might not see a breakthrough instantly or you may be hit by a storm, but a principled life will take you through to the other side of the storm. That's why if you embrace God's principles, you'll get God's outcomes. If you rely on circumstantial evidence, you will fall and you will never stand long term. So let's go on to the stewarding one around tithing because yep. there's lots of questions out there and plenty of debate. But why, from your point of view, is tithing the only place in Scripture where we get to test and to try God? I think simply God is looking to be entrusted to our financial world. He has chosen that there is a part of our increase that belongs to him. Let me just put some things down very quickly. And they are, do you realize that you are living the life you're living wherever you live, whatever you own or don't own, whatever you have, it's because of God's provision. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In fact, you are God's possession. And until you turn your life fully over to God, you don't reap the purpose that God has for you. So God's put in place tithing, which is to test us to prove that God can step in to the most menial things of our lives and bring a breakthrough where we can't bring a breakthrough in ourselves. So God owns everything, yet he says the first tenth belongs to me. If you'd honour me in that first tenth, I'll bless the rest. So all of it will see the breakthrough power of God. And that is why I think it's so important. It's the only place that we're to try God because God's saying this is a testing of your trust. Can you trust me that if you put me first, I'll be with you when all else in this world goes wrong? I will stand through. I know personally for me, I was, uh, I think I was 18 or 19, 18, and I wanted to go to Bible college. And to go to Bible college was an impossibility because I didn't have enough money. And so I thought to myself, but God, I've tithed my whole life. You've promised to break through. In fact, I can remember making a decision in a prayer that I had with God. I said, God, not only will I continue to tithe you, even though if I do tithe, I'll never get to Bible college. I'm going to double it. I'm going to double tithe. The reality is you can't double tithe, but I didn't realize I was tithing and now unlocking the law of sowing. Do you know in the time frame of the next nine to 10 months, I fully paid for all of the fees to go to Bible college. Plus I had enough money to buy a motorbike free because it was in Tauranga and I was living in Wellington and so I could go home and see my parents and family 
and I had enough to pay the fees for the leadership course that came after the course I wanted to go to. God showed me, if you trust me, I will entrust to you even the desires of your heart. That's awesome. And so that for you would be where this Malachi 3 yeah. that we've talked about or touched on became your reality where God says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me, another version, test me. Now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be enough room to receive it. Literally God. Imagine God coming to your place and saying, I want you to prove my existence. I want you to prove that I can step into your financial world by giving the first tenth and trusting me that you've honoured me. It's literally about sovereignty. It's about the wonder of who God is. And so God says, would you test me with that? I did that my whole life, even as a young kid, as I said, but then found myself at a place where I wasn't financially breakthrough, having breakthrough. The reason was it was one part of a four-part equation. And that's what we're teaching this whole financial freedom pathway on. But tithing is that first component of saying, God, I'm returning to you what belongs to you. And I'm going to prove that you will live and respond according to your word. So let me come from a bit of a negative angle then. Yeah, you're always a bit... No, you know, you're always a positive bloke. <laughs> we live in the New Testament. Yep. There's a fairly good debate out there that the idea of tithing is just Old Testament law. What would you say to that? It's an interesting thought. I've had people write to me about that question. My response is very simple. It is in the Old Testament law, but it is not an Old Testament law. And you say, what do you mean by that? It literally means that God's saying, you need to give me the first tenth, it's called a tithe, of all of your increase. And that is to unlock this law that is going to bring a freedom to you. But it's bigger than an Old Testament law. In fact, let's go to Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? Will a man rob God, yet you have robbed me? But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and in offerings. The big word is ordinance. An ordinance is not an Old Testament law. Right. It's a God command. It's something that God is saying, I'm commanding you to do this. And of course, in the law, you had to do it. You had no choice. But God says, we're not under the law. We're under grace. Grace gives us the right to choose. It doesn't change what God says is His. It doesn't change that the pathway God has set is the pathway of freedom. But you get to choose, I get to choose. And so if we make a choice not to tithe because it's an ordinance, then we actually are going to deny God the right of access, as we said before, to prove God. He says it in the first person. And that's the power of what God says. In fact, you go on in Matthew chapter 23, 23. Yeah, well, it was Jesus actually speaking yeah. to those that were questioning and some in of the, the New realities. Testament. In the New Testament, yeah. There he and, is. and it's actually Jesus that says... What sorrow awaits for those that are negative about the reality of who God is and his ways and his ordinances. And he, he challenges the hypocrites, verse 23 says, and Jesus even says these words, yes, you should tithe. It's Jesus confirming in our day, in our age, in our context, the reality of not leaving out this very important yeah. ordinance, right? Yeah. So let me ask you this way then. Can I just not tithe my time instead of my finances? would be good if you did tithe your time. <laughs> uh, I think if we're going to build the kingdom, we need to do something with our time and put God's priority there. But this whole context of tithing is financial. Yeah. This is about financial freedom. This is about our financial world. And you might say, well, I don't need to hear this stuff. I'm already good financially. You can have money, but not be free. Yeah. It's a sovereignty decision. Yes. And so about tithing your time, I think it's a good principle to say, I'm going to make sure I build God's kingdom with my time. 
This is more a sovereignty decision. This is a God ownership decision of our financial world. So you can have all the money in the world, but actually being directed to by the money you have rather than the purposes of God. I see a lot of people with a lot of money that are not being directed by God, they're by being directed by their financial position. So therefore, yes, it does not mean that you can tithe your time and say, I'm free from tithing finances. No, God says that's the test of sovereignty is to do with the thing that takes your heart. So you say you can have a lot of money and still not be financially free. Can I ask it this way? Can you tithe and not live financially free? Yeah, well, again, I think everything that we've shared so far, and if you get a copy of the God, Money and Me book, you'll discover there are four principles. So I tithed my whole life, but wasn't breaking through financially. But financial freedom is an issue of the heart. It's to do with who is sovereign over your life. And God chose finances to be the testing ground. And I love that because Proverbs, as we read last week, reminds us to honour the Lord with our possessions and with the first fruits of our increase so that our barns will be filled with plenty and our vats will overflow with new wine. The truth is the tithe is a testing ground, but it is actually about this pathway you're talking about. But it starts by testing God. Maybe, maybe you touched on the, your 18 and you saw God sovereignly work. Um, you're a little more longer in years than 18 now. Uh, I've got as much hair as you have, Luke. <laughs> anyway, Thank you sorry, for that. Sorry. Genetic blessing. Uh, have you experienced <laughs> some specific supernatural financial blessings recently? I mean, it's, it's cool to look back many decades ago, but what, what's, it, what's the reality even in you now? I may have shared this not that long ago, but uh, our medical journey is just another one of many major miracles that we've had financially. Uh, when we could not get the help through the medical system, because of currently where it's at, even though many people are doing a fantastic job, we had to, for the sake of urgency, go through a private institution, which again, Marie and I looked at each other and said, how would we ever afford that? The bill ended up being an excess of uh, or close to or just to over 300,000, which you just go, well, how did that happen? Along the way, somebody came because I made a decision that we would not make that public in the journey. We didn't want people's sympathy to respond because we're pastors. We wanted to say, well, God, this is another area that you've promised you'd cover everything. And uh, somebody came up to us and said, look, we are in a strong, very strong financial position and we just want you to know, look at us, we want you to know, is what they said to us, that whatever is needed, we're there for you. Which is an absolute <laughs> miracle in that place. But all the way, the, the way I, I remember one time, just very briefly, uh, Marie and I were, again, we were now living this four-part equation of financial freedom but uh, we decided to take a step of faith because we wanted to do more for the kingdom, but we were limited on our salary. So we said, look, we are in a position because of the equity in the home to borrow 200,000 that we would put into a venture that we just prayed over and believed that God would bring a breakthrough in uh, so that we could have more finances for the kingdom. Long and, sh long and short story. Uh, so we invested in this organization or this new startup business and it completely fell flat. We lost 200,000. So now we had a debt that uh, we didn't expect to have. Uh, it was an amazing thing. I think some years later, when we went to sell our house, our house sold for an excess of 200,000 more than any real estate agent believed we would get for it. I don't look at that as just things that happen. I just say God is true to his word. We don't see it in the time frame we want, but God comes through always in the bigger picture. So good. And I love the encouragement you've always shared that this pathway is about taking small steps yeah. and breeding confidence in trusting in who God is and that his word and his way actually works. But it's an interesting thing. I touched on stewarding. We touched on stewarding last week. Uh, and, and this principle of tithing is, is one that actually has to take a continual decision anytime increase comes. It's not just a one-time thing. It, it, it is needed. But 
I just got one more question around this. Why, yep. why would you say, or what is the revelation that the tithe actually belongs in God's house, the church, rather than where we would like it to go? Well, if you come down the thought line scripturally of saying, if God says the tithe is mine, it belongs to me, you're taking something that belongs to me. The 90% of all I've provided for anyway in the earth and given you the power to, to have the brain you have and the ability to make money, it belongs to me. Therefore, if it belongs to him, he gets to decide where it goes. So it doesn't go, this might sound harsh, but I've, I've thought this through and we've gone to God's word on it and I've taught it a number of times. It doesn't go to the missionary who's in need. It goes to God's house. Because God's house is his primary choice of reflection of his kingdom. You and I are in that house, so we're a part of that equation. But God is wanting to provide an answer to the world that shows that God's house has the answer for every need. For us to be able to help the needs in society, we need a healthy house that teaches us how holistically to break through. So therefore, God has got a plan to his purpose. It's not to go wherever you are. That's where your seeding becomes the thing you get to decide about, whereas the stewarding goes to God's house. You say, yeah, but I don't really trust this house or the house you're in. I'd say, well, then get out of the house. Find a new house, a house that you can try and, yeah, but I've been to a lot of churches. Yeah, possibly the problem's not the house. Because how many of these, some people can never be satisfied. Whereas we've got to find God's house. And by the way, no house is perfect. Every house needs painting. And sometimes some things need to be taken out and rebuilt. So don't look for perfection. Look for a house that God's called you to and build the house. Imagine for a moment, let me just say this. Imagine for a moment what life Melbourne, what life Adelaide, what this church here in Auckland and New Zealand could look like if we were all tithing. So let me ask you a question, Pastor Luke, if you've asked me some curly ones. <laughs> what percentage of life would you say are currently tithing? Whoa, put the hard question out. Uh, I'd say it'd be between 20 to 30% of households. What? <laughs> Well, the truth is the church is the hope of the world. And if it was resourced, as you said, if we all got this revelation, uh, we actually could be the answer to our society. <laughs> uh, we are doing amazing things. But yeah, there is currently between 20 to 30% of households from, as we understand it, uh, that would be trusting God in this area. I think that statistic, because I am involved in helping a lot of churches, would be commonplace. Some would be a lot lower than that. And you say, well, why is that? Because this is a part of the enemy's plan, is to not release God's house to provide God as an answer to the world we live in. So that's why I would say for all of us, it's not about, well, the church needs to get money. If that's your attitude, don't give it. I, I don't think we've ever been a church that's demanded anything. Law will demand a response. Grace gives you the option to make a decision. Have there been times that you would like to be stronger on this issue, Pastor Paul? Yes. I'd like to take some people and say, do you realize you're aborting what God could do? But it's not my role, nor is it Grace's role to take the choice away from anyone. Yet I would say to everyone that has a faith in God, if you're not tithing seriously, you're saying, I don't trust God in my financial world. Or... I don't need God in my financial world because I've got finances. But we need to have financial freedom on both areas of breakthrough and finance, but also that there is no deal or issue with lordship around our financial world. That's awesome. Could you talk more around the principles that you talk about in the book around the 10%, obviously, to the tithe, there's tax, and then there's the 10, 10, and 80, uh, and even... Like, it, so it sounds great, but where they came from or where to start yep. when it comes to this practical pathway? Sure. As I said, Marie and I have been, have been for a long time on this journey of principled living. So just logically for me, uh, if God says the first tenth belongs to him, 
then we talked about it and said, wouldn't it be something that we should set as a goal to have 10% that we would sow? If sowing is a divine law that unlocks harvest, wouldn't we work towards that? Straight away, I know many people would say, yeah, but even tithing is a big step to say another 10%. I, I'm not saying to start with 10% of sowing, but remember it's a divine law. When you sow, you initiate reaping, a harvest. But start somewhere. Start with somewhere. So ultimately, I would say in the God, Money and Me book, the goal you should shoot for in your life is if the first tenth is God, that's not negotiable, then work towards 10% becoming seed for harvest. And then if 10% is seeding for harvest, why wouldn't you work towards 10% going to saving? So that's going to have a generational legacy. That's going to help you get out of debt firstly. Secondly, buy a home. Because that home is going to increase in value long term and help create a financial platform for the generations to follow. But you've got tax, of course. So the first thing is giving to God what belongs to God, giving to the government what belongs to the government, because the Bible actually teaches us to do that. It says that uh, when the question was asked of Jesus, Jesus responded, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and render to God what belongs to God. If you're not taxing what the government asks you to tax, you're actually going against what God says to do. Say, so, well, the taxes is just too much. Well, live in another country. I'm being straight, but we don't have time. I'm a lot more gracious in the book. <laughs> but for all of us, it's kind of like, so there is the, the deal of, again, which brings another question. Do I, um, again, give to God the 10th before or after tax? Yeah. Which is another, that's another question I think we were going to get to, wasn't it? Yep. So my Go head's racing ahead, but... Uh, it's, it's kind of like, well, if God says this is what belongs to me, that's what we do. If then the government says this is what belongs to me, this is what we do. And then after that, you look at your, your um, seeding, your saving, and of course, your spending. So the ultimate goal, I would say to anyone, is then shoot for and believe that God will help you get to a place where you can give that first tenth. Another tenth would go to seeding. Another tenth would go to saving. Get your debt out of the way then put it into a house that will go generationally, and then you would spend the rest, which then people go, but that's just impossible. But that would be my response, is start somewhere. Even if it's 1% after you honour God with what is his, that is something that you're seeding. And another 1% is something that you're saving, and then you're living on the rest, and you say, yeah, but I don't want to stay there. Well, I said it, I think, the first week, maybe a little too strongly, but you can work harder. Yeah, but I haven't got a job. What about me, Pastor? Pray for that. I'll pray for you, but I'll also tell you to do some things you might not like to do, which is you might need to knock on doors and take a job that has no money and prove that you're a benefit to them until they have to pay you or do some study and get a greater income. Understand where your strengths are and work in that field. So much more to it than just turning up for a hand on the head, a prayer and a breakthrough. It's both and working together. That's awesome. You, you talked about the seeding, saving. In the book, you talk a bit about this, but why match the two in terms of what you seed and save? I think if we don't live principally, we go off course. So I'm all about setting things in place before you get there. There's always going to be pressures that try to take you away from a planned pathway. And a principled life has the answer to every storm. So I would just say that's where we need to work together. Work for your future, and your future might be firstly getting out of the negative and then be in a place where you're seeding to bring God's divine blessing. Isn't it amazing if you live this out and you actually start, for kids we say start with jars. Uh, as I, adults, I would say as things move forward, you should have an account that's set apart or a part of an account that goes into separating that amount of money so that when you get to the the place of seeing your savings account and then your seeding account begin to grow, you're in a place of being able to help other people because you've got money to do it. It's not taking away from what you don't have. You've already provided ahead of time. So you're not the first one to back off when it comes to pay for a coffee. Remember, you have to go to the bathroom. Oh, I've got an important phone call. Or I'm just blank. I'm just looking the other way. God says, you shouldn't be like that. You, you as a Christian should have an abundance for everything. 
So if you're not there, then take time to consider what is missing in all of those parts of the equation. That's awesome. So what does seeding look like for you? So for Marie and I, because we so believe in this, we began to say we will deny the things that we want to get so that we would have a predetermined amount for seeding. So that was a decision we made some time ago, in fact, a long time ago, and we just decided we would put 10% aside for seeding. So every time we increase financially, not only we honour God with the first tenth, but we would have 10% going to a place that we can give to others. I think one of the areas that that seed can go towards is things like uh, expansion, where we want to expand beyond what is able to do. I think if we were all tithing, we could see expansion fulfilled. And we could do so much more in the community and other people around us. Somebody has a flood and they have no insurance, we can help pay for the carpet or help pay for the rent when somebody's going through something. So seeding for us has been a predetermined amount. And then I've said to people that have a lot of finances, why would you only, well, tithe, you can only tithe 10%. Why would you only seed 10%? Why wouldn't you put 20% aside? Right. And so that you could help a whole lot of people that are, have a whole lot less privilege than you rather than keep on expending it on your own world. world. Keep building your world, but then make sure you've got a predetermined amount that you're saying we're going to bless others and that's going to unlock the law of harvest, which, by the way, is not just a law for your harvest, but the harvest of others. Yeah. Harvest has many fronts where it's expressed. Yeah. That's awesome. And a couple more quick ones. Yep. What does bad spending look like? Spending what you don't have. So the allurement of buy now, interest-free, never says, but you will pay for it later. And I would say bad spending is when you're spending beyond your income unless you're spending into an investment that you still can stay in control of and has a future gain. Uh, whenever you invest in shares, you should only be investing in money you're prepared to lose. Anything you have no control over, I say, from a cautionary point of view, is a bad decision. Right. But if you can lose it, then you can take big steps. So don't just spend what you don't have or don't spend what you can't pay back. So that's what bad spending looks like. Spending under, under pressure, spending because you want to live up to a standard that the world says you have to live up to because it's the cheap price right now. Yeah, it might be cheap right now, but it's not cheap to you if you can't afford it. And this is no reflection on Missy, but what do I do if my spouse doesn't want to tithe? Why would you bring up things before she was a Christian? <laughs> the answer simply to this is you should not make your spouse tithe if they don't want to. We are under not the Old Testament law, but the law of grace, which means that you should encourage your spouse about the revelation that you carry. But if you're in a sticky situation, I would encourage you to have two separate accounts or have your own money that you can tithe on. Maybe it's, well, that's not much of the money that's there. I only get a little bit that I can do what I want to. Just tithe on that. Just honour God with your revelation. But don't enforce it on a spouse. I would pray... And I believe it is the case that life will never be about trying to get money from people. It's about teaching the principal pathway yeah. that God has to live financially free. That's awesome. And do I tithe on my business or house sale if it would be better to reinvest the increase? Big question. Take a lot more time than I've got to say right now. I would say this is when it comes to businesses, it's very tricky because at what point do you tithe on your increase? So some people say, well, I've just started a business and you need the money that you have to invest to get the business up and running. I would say it's not wrong to hold on to increase until you get a dividing line where you look at the increase. Some people haven't tithed on their increase. The, crease, the um, business is built, now it's worth a whole lot of money and then they go to sell it. If they haven't tithed along the way, then they should be tithing on the increase from where they started and where they are now. So you need a lot of wisdom. And I would say here at Life, we've got a lot of people in the business world that can help you with that decision. They won't make you make the decision, but we need to work 
on how we do it and what the right timing is, whereas our increase is easy when it's a salary because here's the finances, we make a decision on that now. Or every time your house increases, it goes from, you bought it for 50,000, you can't do that any of these more these days, you sell it for 70,000, uh, you've increased 20,000, that's your increase. So I would say the normal response would, is you would tithe on any increase of things that have moved forward in value. Awesome. Final question. Good. What would you say to those that say blessing that we're talking about, that God's we're talking about, is not about money? I, say, I would say start reading the Bible and have a look at how God demonstrated what blessing looks like. He created a world that was completely not just fitted out, but had everything to excess. Every miracle that he did, he showed excess. Blessing is about you experiencing the purpose that God has for your life, but to be a place of blessing. And the simple answer is, if we're not blessed, how can we be a blessing in financial ways? I think I'm trying to make it clear, you can't accomplish it overnight, but a principled life will see a blessing life. That blessing should increase. I used to hide the fact that I had a new shirt whenever I had it. And I'd say, oh, somebody bought me that. And I realized God tapped me on the shoulder and say, you don't have to make excuses. And it might be the fact that somebody bought a lot of things that I wear, some of the watches that I wear, are because people have given them to me. But I had to learn, God wants you. God has created streets of gold and he doesn't make an excuse about it. Heaven's going to blow your mind about God being a God of blessing. Go back to the first few verses that we read. And God this is, is able to so make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. It's not about the person next to you. God's will is for you, no matter what state you find yourself in. It's about you. All all, all abundance. Father, today we thank you that you're a God that's bigger than our mind can understand and we are so programmed to the way of this world and even the lies of the enemy when it comes to your heart for financial abundance, that we wouldn't just have abundance to live a bigger world for us, but to touch the world we're in with the bigness of your heart. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will lead each one of us in Jesus' name. Amen.